uh, it's 11 o'clock. Um, so <clears throat> we'll get it going. So morning, everyone. Um, for those of you that don't know, my name is Andrea Marani. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Fentlia. Uh, and I'm delighted this morning to, to welcome Chris Bricky, who's the founder and CEO of Stockspot. Um, thanks for joining us, Chris. Good to have you here. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, nice to join. Um, Chris, uh, you started investing at a, at a very early age, um, and there's a bit of a story there. Um, would, would you take us through that? Uh, what got you into it? Uh, and then also your, your lead up to Stockspot uh, and, and the, the rationale for creation of Stockspot, which then happened in 2013. Uh, yeah, sure. So, yeah, I mean, there is a bit of a story. I'll try and give a, a slightly abridged version um, today. But yeah, I started investing when I was in my early teens. I was fortunate that my dad sort of uh, grabbed a newspaper and showed me what the share market was. And he, he gave me some hypothetical money to invest. Um, he told me at the time it wasn't hypothetical and, and that I was actually investing. But later when I sold my, my first investment and asked for the profits, he told me that uh, they were non-existent, which I think actually inspired me even more to do it myself and, and to you know, not trust my dad who was saying he was investing for me. Um, so, yeah, I learned a lot in my teens about in investing in markets. I was lucky to enter the, the ASX share game while I was at school, which was a, you know, a good way to learn about how markets work. And I... Um, ended up winning that a few times while at school. And then there was a similar competition at university run by JP Morgan, um, which I also won a couple of times. And I think off the back of that, I got the lucky opportunity to work at a hedge fund trading shares while I was studying at uni. So I put all my uni classes on to two days a week and I was trading three days a week. Um, and from there got my sort of dream graduate role, which was working on the proprietary trading desk at UBS. Um, which at, at the time in, in 2007 in Sydney was a pretty big team with, you know, a, a big kind of mandate to trade all sorts of different assets. Um, yeah, fantastic eye opener in, in terms of the world of, you know, trading and arbitrage across different asset classes and, you know, different um, sort of hedge fund type strategies. Um, yeah, ultimately UBS um, shut down that whole business globally in 2012, I believe. Um, yeah, they actually got through the whole financial crisis very well and were very profitable and, and got through Volcker and the other rules in the US. But there was a trader in, uh, in London on the client side who ended up uh, fraudulently losing billions of dollars. And as a result of that, they shut down all of the risk businesses around the world. Um, but that's really what threw me into sort of starting my own business. Um, you know, it was always an observation I had working in um, UBS that... Uh, investing in, in especially large cap Australian shares was just so competitive. I, I mean, I used to sit in board meetings with dozens of other super smart fund managers who were all trying to analyze, you know, stocks like Coca-Cola or Woolworths. And I would be thinking, you know, all of these people are just so smart. Like, how do they all expect to beat each other? Because, you know, they can't all be right on whether Woolworths is overvalued or undervalued. You know, you know for every person with a PhD in this room that gets it right, there's just always got to be one that gets it wrong as well. Um, and, and it kind of got me learning and thinking a bit more around, you know, um, you know, how investing is sort of sold to the average consumer is something that you really need to be very active and, and make a lot of decisions and be reading the paper. And, and that's what's going to help you succeed. And, and I realized that that was sort of a story that's um, concocted by the financial industry to sort of serve the, serve the interests of the industry because it generates, you know, news and, and brokerage and all sorts of other, um, you know, jobs in the industry but ultimately all of the evidence points to it not being the right strategy for most um, investors so for most investors the best strategy is to do nothing most of the time and, and that wasn't a strategy i really saw advertised to many mum and dad investors you know i even saw my own parents sort of believing in this idea that they needed to turn over their portfolio and buy and sell um, and, and so i thought there was just a great opportunity to start a business that educated consumers about how to sort of invest based on the evidence of what really matters, you know, focus on asset allocation, diversification, keeping your costs low, you know, uh, you know, keeping your risk in line with the, the amount of risk you should be taking um, and, and try and block out the noise. Um, and around the same time, ETFs were sort of emerging in Australia as a, a new way of um, accessing different asset classes that I just thought were a, a sort of fanta a fantastic sort of conduit, a way of sort of getting access to asset classes that people hadn't in the past. Um, and, and, and at the same time, also, a lot of people were putting a bit more trust into online services for all other parts of their life, you know, whether it was, you know, you know booking a holiday or, or doing online shopping. And I just thought that financial services was one of those areas that still was very much offline 
to get advice, you used to you know, need to speak to an advisor or go into an office. And I just thought that that probably wasn't the way that people would interact with that sort of service in the future. Um, and I guess some of those sort of those trends were what led me to start the business. Well done. It's been an amazing story. Great success. It's incredible growth. And I mean, we've seen you a lot in the press lately as well. I love the Q&A you've got going on on LinkedIn. And one of the questions that came through was talking about your two favorite books, When Geniuses Fail, When Genius Fail, and also Random Walk Down Wall Street. Maybe give us a bit of insight into, into, into those two. Yeah, sure. I mean, they're two of my favorites. So, yeah, there's lots of great investing books out there, but that was a question that actually came through from one of our clients. So, I mean, I, I thought they're quite different books, but, but good ones for anyone that's sort of learning about investing to read. Like uh, when, when Genius Failed is, is, I mean, one very entertaining book, but it also shows that even the smartest people in finance, and these are people who won Nobel Prizes, um, even the, the smartest blokes in the room don't always win. And, and markets are so hard to beat that often, you know, even the smart guys out there, um, you know, lose in a pretty spectacular way. And that also strategies that sort of seem to work for a period of time um, often unravel themselves because everyone starts doing them or, or risk gets built, built up in the system. So, you know, it's kind of a good way to educate yourself around, you know, the, the bigger picture, you know, how investing works and how the professionals are doing it. Um, you know, on the other hand, Random Walk Down Wall Street's a, a classic from the 1970s that really was one of the first books to pitch the idea of index investing and, and the fact that, you know, trying to beat the market is, is very difficult um, and, and that's why indexing works. You know, there's a, a lot of great analogies in that book and, it, it, um, yeah, I think it's a book that sort of stood the test of time to kind of explain, you know, why investing is, against the index at least, a zero-sum game and, and it's not a game you really need to compete in to win. Yeah, yeah. So, so looking at indexing and then ETFs, which have been around 30 odd years now and starting to get some momentum in, in Australia. I saw, um, I was looking at your um, ETF report uh, that Stockspot put out a little while ago, um, currently at 57 billion um, and across about 212 odd ETFs, expected to grow to 100 billion by 2022. Um, I mean, there's a... Th that, that's significant growth, but there's also a lot of underperforming uh, ETFs, which you, you also raise in your report. H how do you see that, um, the market sort of managing that? Do, do you think e underperforming ETFs will just eventually just disappear, be shut down, and those funds redeployed into different ones? Or do you think, um, I'd just be, be interested to get your insight into how you think that market's going to develop, because I mean, that is significant growth. And uh, you just wonder about some of these underperforming ones and even some of the more illiquid ones. Um, you know, there was a scare that in a case like this, another m market downturn, that people, there'd be a bit of a rush on uh, people, you know, wanting to liquidate out of them. And then what do you do if the ETF is linked to some of the more uh, illiquid underlying stocks where you might see a price differential between that and the stocks? I'd be keen to get your insights uh, into that. We, I mean, first of all, in the overall growth, I mean, when I started Stockspot, I think we were at about eight or nine billion. So from, from getting from there, I think it's now up to 60 billion this month. I mean, it's phenomenal growth, but still Australia is a long way behind the rest of the world. So, you know, Canada is probably the, um, you know, closest equivalent to us in terms of share market size and, and GDP and, and their ETF market is much, much bigger than ours. And, and ours would need to you know, at least double or triple to be anywhere close to theirs. So, you know, I still think we're well behind the rest of the world. And my theory on that has always been around um, you know, uh, investment product distribution in Australia. Um, typically, ETFs haven't had a lot of take up because they haven't provided a lot of incentives to um, you know, people who are the distributors of financial products to, to recommend them. But I think that's slowly changing. Obviously, the Royal Commission and um, you know, you know, some of the recommendations out of that will you know, continue to shake up the industry and, and probably um, you know, make some advisors you know, you know, question the sorts of products they were potentially recommending in the past. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of you know, great advisors that are already recommending ETFs or using them in, you know, in portfolios in conjunction with other things. Um, I mean, on, on your other question around liquidity, I mean, there's, I mean, what I've seen in the last seven years is there's all sorts of different myths that get sort of spread around about ETFs because unfortunately ETFs are eating the lunch of a lot of, um, a lot of lots of people in the industry. Um, you know, there are great ones like that they, you know, that they only work in up markets and not down markets, which has been, you know, which has been fantastically disproven over the last few months, um, because still in the, in the worst sort of market falls in the last 20 or 30 years that we saw last quarter, 
um, you know, ETFs did better than active funds and listed investment companies and about 60% of active fund managers still underperform the index. Um, one of the other, yeah, one of the other big um, sort of furfies out there is that there's kind of going to be a big sort of a liquidity problem with people that are investing in the index or that, um, that are index hikers when markets move down. You know, I mean, there's lots of sort of um, ways of sort of disproving this, but I mean, ETFs only are a way of accessing underlying securities and they're the same sort of securities that people would be accessing if they were giving their money to active fund managers and, you know, redemptions or selling investments, you know, always happens when markets fall because that's the nature of people. Um, it's not the nature of the underlying products. And so absolutely when markets fall, they tend to overshoot just as when markets rise, they tend to overshoot that that has nothing to do with ETFs. It's happened for you know, decades and decades before ETFs um, existed through direct shares or through, you know, managed funds. Um, so ETFs don't sort of perpetuate moves um, for ETFs that invest in liquid assets like, you know, shares or, or liquid bonds. Um, there is plenty of liquidity and, and, you know, there is still very sort of small spreads between bids and ask, even when markets are very volatile. Now, absolutely. If the underlying assets behind an ETF, um, are, are an asset class that is less liquid, then the ETF is going to reflect that as well. Um, so for our clients, I mean, we, we stay well clear of ETFs where there isn't decent underlying liquidity, um, you know, because of this. Um, but, but even so, I mean, we don't recommend people to be trading when markets are, are extremely volatile and, and trying to exit because in all asset classes, you, you're going to basically cross a bigger spread when markets are volatile because that's just how markets work. Um, so yeah, I mean, ETFs did sort of did really um, perform very well during this recent stress test. Um, you know, from a liquidity perspective, they, they did well. Um, you know, we weren't. You know, we didn't have any issues providing liquidity to clients that needed it on a sort of you know on a you know T plus two basis, which is what ETFs are in Australia because they're listed on the market. Um, you know, and, and that sort of compares to a lot of, a lot of other asset classes at the moment that that different people are really struggling to get out of or, or work out, you know, how they should be priced. And, um, and ET, uh, let's look at listed versus unlisted ETFs. Do you think, do you think they're going to be the, the death of the managed funds or, or certainly from a retail perspective, uh, they're a lot easier for, for investors to access than managed funds. How do you see, how do you see that going? Well, I mean, there's sort kind of two dynamics. So there's like listed versus unlisted and, and that's more around sort of convenience. Like, you know, there's, there's listed active funds and, and there's listed index funds and there's unlisted active funds and there's unlisted um, index funds. So there's kind of the listed unlisted argument. And, and for me, that's more just around, um, you know, ease of access for, for people and ETFs have really made traditional unlisted index funds just a lot more easy to access, but also they've brought pricing down because they've basically passed on institutional pricing to everyone where traditionally, if you bought unlisted index funds, the pricing was, you know, not, not that attractive if, if you're a smaller investor. Um, so, you know, I think ETFs, you know, or just listed um, in investment funds will continue to become more popular just because of their ease of access um, and, and sort of technology will probably speed up that process. Um, then there's a question of the sort of indexing versus active. And, and yeah, I mean, my, my views are no, uh, are no secret on, on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think ETFs, you know, have, have proven to be just so far superior to a lot of the other um, active products out there, whether they're listed or unlisted. You know, the listed um, products of listed investment companies, you know, is, is a good example of, of an area that still sort of, you know, attracted a lot of money. Um, you know, despite really, you know, poor performance. Um, but I think, you know, the recent sort of decision by the government to stop um, commissions being paid from this, you know, this type of product, which we were, you know, very strongly advocating for, will probably reverse that trend and see a lot more going into ETFs. Yeah, I was going to raise that. The recent ASIC ruling um, uh, is interesting. I mean, the commissions on, on LIX have been, have been quite significant, in some cases up to 3%. Um, with that falling away, do you think, uh, do you think that's going to kill off uh, listed investment? I mean, because there, there is then that debate of active versus passive, which you've touched on. Do, do you think um, that's going to see quite a significant flight from, from LICs? I mean, I, I think what it will do is it just makes it more of a, a fair playing field. And I think successful um, you know, active fund managers that can sell themselves and have a performance track record that they can talk about, I mean, they'll still continue to succeed because they have a great story to tell and they haven't relied on... Um, sort of perverse motivations of the sellers of their products in order to get them sold. Um, and, and so, 
you know, I, I think it just makes things sort of more fair and, and there'll be still some that succeed. I mean, my guess would be there wouldn't be as much money going into these products because, you know, from having a look at a lot of the ones that have listed over the last few years, you know, there's probably a few that wouldn't have gotten up, in my opinion, had they not, um, you know, incentivized the people selling them. And a lot of them, unfortunately, have, have, have sort of produced really terrible returns and outcomes for investors. So, you know, it's a really a great thing that people can no longer get um, sold to, you know, essentially provide advice around what sort of investment people should be making because it just causes a conflict that, you know, can't be resolved. Yeah, yeah. I might just put it to the listeners. Uh, you can hit the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen if you've got any questions for Chris. Um, Chris, looking at performance of funds, so in the, in the uh, recent report that you put out, Palladium, uh, certainly a big performer along with gold and a lot of the commodities. Um, would you mind talking us through that, just your findings on ones that over, or ETFs and sectors that performed well versus ones that, um, that didn't do that well? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's, as you mentioned before, like tons of ETFs listed, like 200 in Australia. Some of them follow very broad indices and some of them, you know, follow more niche areas like specific commodities or specific um, sectors. Um, so, I mean, every year you tend to find the broad ones, you know, aren't, don't provide the extreme returns in either direction. They, they sort of are sort of somewhere in the middle and it's always the, you know, the highly leveraged ETFs or the, um, you know, the more um, nuanced ETFs that provide the, either the killer high returns or the, or the big losses. Um, and I mean, this year was no different. As you mentioned, Palladium was a huge returner and it has been for a few years because, you know, uh, you know th there's been a lot of demand for their use in you know, electric vehicles and this sort of thing. Um, you know, maybe some people predicted that, you know, others probably didn't, but in any case, like it's, um, you know, been very good for the Palladium ETF, uh, which I should mention is a pretty small one. Um, you know, the gold ETF has ri risen for, you know, probably very different reasons, you know, negative real interest rates and, you know, and, and what's been happening um, with the world in terms of the balance sheets of, of different, um, you know, reserve banks around the world. Um, but yeah, I mean, those two are two of the best performers. Like the, one of the worst performers of the year was the oil ETF. Um, a lot of that was due to the structure of the ETF and the, the cost of, um, you know, rolling futures every month, especially when the oil market recently, at least, was in a pretty steep contango, um, which led to a lot of these ETFs actually changing their strategies just to survive. So moving from um, basically matching one month futures to sort of spreading it over multiple months. Um, so, I mean, for us, we, we generally, for clients at least, avoid a lot of these high octane ETFs that you know can either do extremely well or extremely poorly, um, but people are certainly interested in them. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. I mean, we, we put it in our report, you know, more out of an interest perspective, but what we do see is ETFs that, that do extremely well one year, often, you know, will be on the other side of the pile the next year. So a couple of years ago, property ETFs, um, or, you know, listed property ETFs in Australia one, was one of the best performing assets. And, um, you know, after oil, it was the worst performing asset over the last 12 months. Yeah. And um, we had, uh, just moving on to sort of state of the economy at the moment, we had uh, Alan Kohler on last week and he gave some good insights into uh, sectors uh, that he felt, you know, that all that he was watching or, or ones that he felt were well positioned to come out of, out of this period. Um, and there's so much, you know, in the press and now there's in the AFR this morning, uh, WHO is saying, oh no, we're not even near a second wave yet. We're still sort of halfway through the first, which felt like that was a little bit more maybe for Brazil's benefit. But um, it seems as though, you know, there's some really interesting conversations now happening um, with the unions and scrummers using this as an opportunity to tackle some, some issues that have been around for a while. How do you see, uh, how do you see us going in, in the coming months? Um, we seem pretty well placed along with New Zealand coming out of this, uh, coming out of this period. Uh, what are you keeping your eye on or what areas do you think uh, are ones to watch in the coming months? Well, yeah, I mean, my answer is yeah, probably less exciting than Alan's because I, I mean, my view is that you know, making projections is pretty useless when it comes to the economy or the share market because, you know, mostly in most cases, the information that you know is already information that everyone else already knows as well and is probably already built into the prices. And, and so, you know, when I was a trader, the question you always have to ask yourself is what edge do I have over everyone else? You know, and I would question whether, you know, 99% of the population has any edge in sort of projecting what are the sex sectors that are going to be successful. Um, and, and even if you do correctly project it, it's, if it's information that already, you know, everyone knows, it's probably already embedded in the share price. And so really won't give you any extra edge over anyone else. 
Um, now, obviously, there are trends like you know the move to e-commerce that you know makes more sense. Um, but but Amazon's already trading at an all-time high. Um, so information has been pretty quickly disseminated into the businesses that you know everyone knows are going to be successful out of this. You know, I, I think what would be more interesting is sort of the um, you know the, the sectors that no one's talking about that may be successful. But the reality is that you know nobody really knows. Otherwise, they'd be talking about them. So, I mean, yeah, I think it's 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 very popular in markets to want to sort of project forward and, and guess what's going to happen. You know, unfortunately, you know, I think that happens a bit too much because in reality, most people don't know. And, and I think it gives people a false sense of confidence to, you know, try and make investment decisions based on these sorts of projections. Um, you know, there, there's a small group of people out there, I truly do believe that can sort of, um, you know, that do have edge in this area and, and can make money out of it. Um, but these are people that are, you know, probably running, you know, closed hedge funds and, and earning two and 20 and you know are, are making sure that they're getting paid very well for that extra extra knowledge they have and the extra edge that they have um, so yeah i mean i mean for the listeners and for any anyone of our clients you know I, I always sort of kind of ask them to you know ask themselves you know what edge do you have in that information and and what do you know that no one else knows and, and when will everyone else know that because that's what's also important you not only need to know something that no one else knows but you eventually need that information to seep into prices for you to be profitable yeah. Um, so yeah, for you, for you to have a successful you, you not only need to know what sectors are going to be successful, but you need to also be able to project when other people will start to know about that and, and lead those prices to increase. Um, all, sounds, all sounds very hard, which is why ETFs are <laughs> certainly that much more appealing. I mean, look at Afterpay, right? Who would have called that down to $8 uh, and now yesterday breaking, breaking the 50 Oh well, yeah, in retrospect, lots of people seem to have called it. Um, but I mean, that's the problem, unfortunately, with all share market projections. And you sort of see it everywhere is that, you know, all the time people are making predictions, but there's really no one that's going back and actually reviewing those predictions to see how successful they are. And, and then only talking to the people that make successful projections. So yeah. what seems to happen so much is that, you know, fund managers are interviewed all the time in the paper and in all sorts of places like they're the experts, but there is no filter as to whether their previous um, projections were successful in actually deciding whether they are indeed experts or not. Yeah. <laughs> and if we look at, um, uh, let's talk about tech for a bit. So looking at robos and, and what you're doing at Stockspot and, you know, over, over the past few years, seen a nice rise from, Six Park and, and some of the other uh, robos, Clover, um, obviously Ray's, you know, doing doing their thing as well and, and achieving good growth. What's your uh, what's your view on the future of tech? I mean, you know, I hate all of these acronyms and, and uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning and everything else everyone else fr throws about. But how, how do you see uh, that playing out in terms of robos, you know, for retail, direct B2C like you do, or ones that are looking at, you know, how can they maybe tailor some of their tools into the advisory space and help advisors, maybe more with efficiency tools and that. How do you see tech uh, playing out in, in that role in the coming years? Well, yeah, I mean, first of all, on the robot side of things, I think it's a lot less exciting and, and um, scary than a lot of people sort of make out. I mean, really the tech of our business is all around automating things that people used to do in the past that weren't very efficient and that ended up costing clients a lot of money. Um, and, you know, creating a better customer experience. Um, and, and so technology really for us is focused on those two things as opposed to, you know, coming up with fantastic trading ideas, which, you know, I don't believe technology or, or uh, most people can do. So, you know, our investment strategy is actually very simple um, and, and sort of proven, you know, over many generations. It's just the technology that allows people to access it in a, in a really, um, you know, easy to use way that actually does a lot of the work for them um, and, and does it in a, in a way that's very efficient. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in terms of adoption by other sectors, uh, my, my sort of vision for financial advisors in the future is that they'll become um, curators of the best in breed services out there. So, you know, in the past, financial advisors were kind of locked to a platform or locked to a, a, a service offering based on who they were employed by. I think there'll be a lot more independent advisors out there in the future who have the flexibility to pick and choose the best things out there. And so for insurance, you know, they might pick, you know, an online web, you know, an online service that helps, you know, helps their client, um, you know, find the right insurance or for mortgages, there may be a different service provider. Um, for investing, I, I mean, I think uh, what we offer, you know, uh, 
you know, I mean, is a great experience for the end client and actually um, is in the best interest of the end client. So really it should be something that advisors are considering, you know, compared to a lot of the other services out there. Um, and I think, um, I think more will over time, um, but it will rely on probably the advisor business model changing a bit. So they're becoming more of a curator of all sorts of best in breed services, as opposed to locked into, you know, one particular platform. And, uh, and do you think uh, uh, automation of, of investing, you know, some of the AI and the machine learning stuff we're seeing, uh, which feels like it's very much still in the early days, do you think that'll, that'll have an impact um, and you start to see more automation around, around investing? Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of see AI and machine learning getting thrown around a lot in investing. And, and I mean, often when you ask people to sort of explain it a bit more, I, I, I don't really get a lot out of them. So, I mean, I, I love sort of hearing about actual user cases where, they, where, where these sort of things can be used. I haven't heard too many that have been that compelling. I mean, if, if it's sort of AI or machine learning that's sort of picking stocks or, or sectors or industries, um, you know, that's great. If it's successful, you know, I'm, I'm sure a hedge fund will pay a lot of money for it and, and run it you know, like Millennium or something like that in the background, but it's probably not something that the average punter out there is going to have access to. Um, you know, where it can make business processes more efficient within a business, like, you know, FinClear or like Stockspot, you know, that's great because it can, it can be, you know, a cost saving that can be passed on to users. So, you know, maybe on the like clearing or administration or these sorts of areas are areas that historically have involved a lot of human, um, you know, uh, involvement that, um, you know, machine learning might be able to solve. Um, but it's probably a lot of these unsexy areas like, um, you know, clearing and administration where there, there's actual practical uses for these. Whereas I think consumers think that it's, you know, it's AI that's going to help them, um, you know, make a million dollars quicker, which you know, I think, you know, probably isn't the right way to look at it. Yep, no, fair enough. That makes sense. Um, perfect, Chris. Thank you. Let me just check. Uh, we've got a question that's come through. Um, tech as a COVID mitigation tool via the navigating the second, third waves, etc. From David. So, how do you see tech as a as a as a mitigation tool to help us navigate the waves that are expected? Uh, you're probably asking the wrong question about that. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I've, I've got no medical qualifications. I've got no uh, qualifications on, you know, epidemiology. So I've got no idea, to be honest. I mean, I'd be trusting the experts and what they say around how tech can help mitigate that, those sorts of things. Yeah, I think, I mean, that is a tricky question. I suppose, you know, keeping the borders closed for longer. It, it looks as though a lot of the cases that are coming through lately are, are imported. You know, they're, they're people that are in quarantine. Um, so maybe just keeping, keeping the borders shut for longer. Um, and maybe just limiting movement. But yeah, that's, that, that is a challenging question. Yeah, I mean, uh, Dave, I saw David, you, you've written financial risk. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, our, our view on risk is that, you know, most risk is priced quite correctly in markets and anyone that has any edge in sort of pricing risk, um, you know, better than others, you know, you know, is probably making money off it themselves. Um, and, and, and that helps to sort of arbitrage that opportunity away pretty quickly and, and makes it hard for people to, you know, work out sort of secret ways of, of um, you know, assuming risk. You know, what we saw as a business is a lot of, you know, a lot of nervousness at the end of March where most, you know, financial advisors and fund managers were saying, you know, don't invest more into the markets. Like it's, you know, um, unemployment's about to go crazy and, and, you know, you want to stay away. But what in, in reality happened was that markets were well ahead of that. You know, markets already fell and reflected that. And, you know, I think since when the markets bottomed in the US late March, there's been 36 million people that have become unemployed and yet the share market's up 30% or so. So, you know, markets are well ahead always on, on risk. Um, you know, we were actually doing the opposite for clients when markets were collapsing because the equity allocation in their portfolios had become smaller and gold had become a lot bigger. We were actually, um, you know, buying equities and selling gold. Now, I'm not sure how many kind of risk models out there would have suggested that to be a good decision at the time. You know, we got a lot of questions from clients around it because, you know, intuitively, you know, when things are seeming very bad and, and when they're at their worst is probably when you want to be taking the least risk. But, um, you know, historically, that's probably the time to be actually taking more risk. Um, yeah, I think that's probably how we looked at risk through the crisis was, you know, when is the time that no one wants to be putting on risk that really you should be adding a bit more to, to keep your overall risk profile, you know, intact. 
Perfect. Thank you, Chris. I think we probably we haven't got any more questions uh, coming through. Uh, thanks. Great answer. Um, so we'll probably leave it there. So, Chris, uh, thank you. Thanks to the listeners. And Chris, thank you very much for, for joining us today. And um, look forward to chatting to you again in the, in the future. Thanks. Yeah, look forward to seeing you down in Melbourne. And uh, yeah, hopefully you get to meet your whole team soon. Yes, absolutely. Looking forward to getting out, getting out the house indeed. Thanks so much, Chris. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Take care. Cheers.